In this video, we're going to be doing an overview of a condition called medial tibial stress syndrome, usually abbreviated MTSS. It's more commonly known as shin splint syndrome or just shin splints. If you look over here at this image of the right lower leg, you can see in red here the typical location of shin splint pain. And this is actually going to be the attachment site of some of the muscles uh, that end up getting overworked in medial tibial stress syndrome, like the tibialis posterior muscle, and even the tibialis anterior muscle is sometimes implicated in MTSS. This is a very common condition in runners, and what I want you to notice here about this picture is what is actually poor running form. So if you look here, this person is actually striking the ground with their heel. Now when you learned the gait cycle, typical gait, just for walking, there is heel strike at initial contact. This actually changes with running. It turns out that proper running mechanics should actually have forefoot or at the very least midfoot contact. And having this heel contact actually increases the risk of developing medial tibial stress syndrome. So there are several pieces of criteria to diagnose somebody with medial tibial stress syndrome. And the first is, is the person is going to describe pain as being along the distal one-third of the posteromedial tibial border, as you see right here. In some cases, the pain can be more anteromedial, in particular if the tibialis anterior is more implicated than the tibialis posterior. But generally speaking, it's going to be the posterior one-third of the posteromedial tibial border. Number two, the pain needs to be exercise-induced. So it doesn't matter if the person's a runner, a jumper, or anything in between. That specific activity, in particular doing it more and more and more, needs to bring on that pain, specifically that posteromedial tibial pain. And then number three, painful palpation. And that painful palpation needs to be a length of at least five centimeters, five consecutive centimeters, over the length of the patient's familiar painful area. And the more of these that are satisfied, the more likely it is that the person has medial tibial stress syndrome. So what is the mechanism of medial tibial stress syndrome? Well, the exact mechanism is under debate, but one of the most plausible cases would be that of muscle imbalance in terms of strength and inflexibility. And we're mainly thinking about muscles like the tibialis anterior and posterior, and then also the triceps seri group, which contains the gastrocnemius and the soleus. So let's take running for example. So if somebody is doing more and more running and they have weakness in any of these muscles, in particular uh, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, well then that muscle is going to fatigue. And when that muscle fatigues it's going to cause altered running mechanics. And by altered running mechanics it means increased reliance on let's say uh, the tibialis anterior and posterior. Okay. And you can see these muscles over here. You can see where they attach on the tibia. This right here in the back is tibialis posterior. This one would be tibialis anterior. And we know that they originate on certain parts of the tibia. But if you look more microscopically, uh, the point of contact is actually at the periosteum of the bone. And so overuse of these muscles during running, especially over and over again, is going to cause irritation of that periosteum at the origins of these muscles. And so that's implying that medial tibial stress syndrome is really just a specific form of periostitis, irritation or inflammation of the periosteum of the tibia. So what are some risk factors for developing medial tibial stress syndrome? Well, the first here is overload, in particular overload that occurs too quickly. We should always be trying to progress exercises, but never progress too quickly. If you progress the training duration, the intensity, the speed, or anything else too quickly, you're not giving these muscles a chance to adapt. And so that can lead to irritation of that periosteum, as we were talking about, and the development of shin splints. Running on hard or uneven surfaces, especially if the person has bad running shoes with poor shock absorbing capacity. If somebody comes in and you think they have medial tibial stress syndrome, you need to look at their shoes. Maybe the shoes don't fit right. Maybe they need a special kind of shoe. Maybe the shoe is so old and worn out that it's already causing poor mechanics in running or jumping. 
And so you need to look at their shoes and possibly even refer them to somebody who will fit their specific feet for a specific pair of shoes and even orthotics. And sometimes those orthotics can be especially important when the person has excessive subtalar pronation, which is common in pes planus or flat feet. Flat feet increases the likelihood of developing shin splints, and so too does unequal leg length. And then women. And it's not the physical state of being female. It's things associated with it, in particular in sports like running, jumping, track and field, etc. So women in those sports are more likely to have nutritional deficits. Sorry for the misspelling there. And those nutritional deficits can lead to hormonal imbalances. And in particular, if the person is not doing adequate resistance training, strengthening some of these muscles like the gastroxoleus, uh, some of the other leg muscles, and also not doing appropriate flexibility training, that can predispose them to biomechanical abnormalities, okay, leading to medial tibial stress syndrome. Also having a high BMI, so extra weight makes it more likely. And then something that I didn't put here, which I probably should have, is going back to the very first slide when we talked about running with heel contact. So if you were to go look at the walking gait cycle, you would see that initial contact is heel contact. You strike with the heel, that is a normal walking pattern. Now what is the difference between walking and running, other than the speed? Well, in walking, there are moments of double limb support, and in general, they occur during pre-swing, initial contact, and loading response. With running, double limb support is eliminated. There is no period of double limb support in running. It is always single limb support. So that's one difference. And then the other big difference is that when somebody lands, so initial contact during running, it is not supposed to be with the heel. It is actually supposed to be forefoot contact or at the very least midfoot contact. And going off of this initial contact with the forefoot or midfoot, if we go look at the contralateral leg here, which is in toe-off, and then look at this leg that's swinging through that will eventually get forefoot contact, you'll notice the ankle never extends in front of the knee. If you look at the heel strike right here, you'll notice that the foot and ankle are way out in front of the knee. During walking, there probably is enough shock absorption from the heel strike, in particular with the knee bent to 5 degrees, quadricep activity, the glutes activating there, there's probably enough shock absorption. Now with running, a much greater speed, a lot more force required to absorb, that heel strike is not going to be sufficient shock absorption. Okay, That's going to lead to medial tibial stress syndrome. So not only should, during swing here of this leg, should the ankle never come in front of the knee, but the contact is actually with the forefoot, or at very least the midfoot. And so in treating medial tibial stress syndrome, you need to look at the person's running mechanics. And of course, that involves footwear. But looking at that initial contact, you may need to make suggestions that the person change their running style. They may need to learn to land at the very least with the midfoot, but preferably with the forefoot because there's much better shock absorption there. And then there's some more obvious things, like stretching tight muscles. Maybe it's the tibialis anterior, tibialis posterior. The triceps surrey are very common to be tight. Also strengthening weak muscles, and it could be those same muscles, among others up in the thigh. And then addressing all other aspects of the athletics. Nutrition, rest, and then getting a graded exposure approach back to the previously painful sport. So once you address some of these things, like the running mechanics, loosening tight muscles, strengthening weak muscles, you don't want to just send them back to sprinting if that's what they do. You'll start off maybe with a light jog and then gradually expose them to higher and higher speeds, maybe higher and higher inclines, etc. Okay. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of medial tibial stress syndrome. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.